Hey, it's Icaris, and I'm here to tell you about Hotcast for Podcasting. We are a podcasting studio located in Las Vegas, Nevada, in the Hot 702.5 FM studios. You can book online at hot7025fm.com. Just click on Hotcast. You can book and find your times right there. Thank you for booking with Hotcast for Podcasting. This quick podcast hits on the struggles and advantages of being an entrepreneur. It's for anyone who's made the commitment to burn the boats and not look back. Are you a busy entrepreneur or small business owner trying to do it all? Then this podcast is for you. Corey and Julie will take you through the details of building a strong business. Hit the subscribe button and gear up for another episode of Biz Quick Podcast. All right, and welcome to Biz Quick. We are the Vegas t- series. The Vegas series. We're talking with Eric, uh, Amber Furman. We have Mark in the studio and Julie as well. Always here. Always here. How you doing, Amber? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. So tell us about yourself. Oh, good lord! What yes. do you want to know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a really small town. Moved to Vegas. You know, small town in the or small city girl in the big town that sounded awful um it sounds a little bit like julia roberts i know i was just in, thinking uh, that what was that movie yeah the um, one where she's the prostitute yeah pretty yeah. woman yeah oh, God, i mean how, you remember that and i didn't i am <laughs> a criminal a defense movie. attorney i guess it's not too far <laughs> off right so um yeah i moved to vegas for my career um went to law school in michigan ended up here wait um, pause when you say michigan do you mean m go blue michigan Go Green, Michigan. Oh, Amber, you were so close. I know, so close. So close. If it helps, I didn't really have a preference. Just don't tell any of my Lansing friends that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell anybody, but, know, you know. Right? It's I, a secret. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we well, didn't even go to Michigan, so. Shut up. That's... <laughs> <laughs> no one needs to know. No, God, I grew Corey. up in Idaho where there's no sports. I was just happy to have somebody to root for. Mm. Like, I was just tired of picking teams that were randoms. So. Yeah. Yeah, sure. What part of our Idaho? Southern part, okay. um, right above Salt Lake, if anybody knows that, about an hour north. Yeah. So. Okay. Such a beautiful state. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And All s- the Californians are invading it now, though. Yeah. They are. That's mm. what I hear. <laughs> so you're a criminal defense attorney here? I am. Criminal defense and immigration okay. is the reason I came to Vegas. Um, have my own practice here, which is amazing. And then, you know, how I know Julie is through, you know, Arate and having conversations with her and being able to talk about the um, breakdown that I had in 2016 that led me to coaching and podcasting and NLP and all of that good stuff that led me to opening my own business because law school doesn't fix everything, it turns out. No, it doesn't. No. Yeah, six-figure incomes aren't all they're cracked up to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I'm just going to be up front. A criminal defense attorney in Las Vegas. There's yeah. a lot of pictures in my head right now. About... <laughs> Most of them are probably right. I mean, if you picture somebody sitting at a desk being bored out of their mind, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that is not what we <laughs> picture. No, no, not at all. No, I know it's not what most people picture. It's not as as I mean, obviously we get the crazy police reports and we get the information that you just don't ever really consciously think about if you're not in the field um, or you try not to. But really, it's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of paperwork and a lot of of motions and arguing and yeah we almost would have needed you yesterday so mark got roofied um last night and um we were very nervous that he was going to end up um being picked up by you know the police and put in jail when he almost completely passed out at a slot machine Oh, that happens all the time in Vegas. Yeah. I, <laughs> you're I, fine. I, I don't really think it would have been that yeah. out of the ordinary. Yeah, you're good. They would have just thought it was another day. Yeah. It's a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. <laughs> it's a Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. It's that's a Tuesday true. in Vegas. It felt much more scary last night. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it did. I bet it is. It's a big problem here, man. Being roofied? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Let's get Legit. into that. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much I can get into. It's just a big problem. Like, we, we have a bigger um, problem with... Um, drugs like that than i thought we did when i came out here so wow that's yeah. great well we we i mean in all seriousness like we're something something clearly happened to him last night because all of a sudden one minute he was upright and the next minute he was not and it's well he had slept for like 14 hours and he's still not feeling great 
Yeah, I have I have um, clients that tell me like they get arrested for a DUI and they're like, dude, I don't know what happened. Like I had like two drinks and I don't remember getting in my car. So it happens all the time. Wow. Yeah. So tell us about your business. Is it just you? Yeah. So I have a solo law practice, um, criminal defense and immigration here in Las Vegas. I also have a podcast called More Than Corporate that I started after. I started discovering everything that law school didn't give me that I thought it would. Um, I have a coaching consulting business, Success Development Solutions. I do neurolinguistics training here. Um, and I'm a director of a um, networking organization. So which one do we want to dig into? You got a lot going on there. <laughs> so there's a few of them that I want to dig into. I really, so I'm, I'm very, I, want, I, want, I definitely want to talk about the, Neuro mm -hmm. linguistics, yes. programming. Yeah, I want to talk about that because I've done some reading on that before, and I know, um, and I can't. I, we'll get into it. The other thing that I want to talk about is you've mentioned twice now the law school didn't give you everything you thought it should give you, um, and I'm guessing by that you mean sort of the business side of being an attorney, like you know how to practice law, you know how to argue a case, you know how to do all of those very lawyerish things. But when it comes to like running a business, is it is it somewhat equivalent to like what happens to dentists and doctors where they spend all this money on education and then they don't have any idea how to actually run a business? It absolutely is. That, that wasn't what I was referring to. I'll get into what I was referring to in a minute. But you're 100% right. Like I tell people all the time that college prepares you for grad school and grad school prepares you for whatever entrance, entrance exam you have to take to get into your career. It doesn't prepare you to do your career. Like I didn't know how to biz do I didn't know how to business. I didn't know how to run a business. Yeah. I didn't know, you know, you don't even really know how to practice law. You know how to pass the bar exam. Like, you know how to take tests. That's yeah. really what you know how to do. And then you learn how to practice law by practicing and, and internships and getting in there and doing all of that stuff. For me, though, it was more of a, like, law school's kind of a blur for me because there was so much going on in my life at the time and so much crap I didn't want to deal with. Um, I had lost my dad in 2001 and I hadn't dealt with any of that. Um, and I kind of thought that I would never have to if I ended up with that six figure income and the law degree that everything else would just fall into place. Nothing else would matter. Um, I think that especially in our generation, that six figure income is kind of that moment, right? Like you grow up and you think as soon as I make six figures, it's all going to be okay. So you have these unrealistic expectations. And I you know, three years into practicing, it was like all of a sudden it all hit me all at once that this was just life. Like it wasn't going to get any better on its own. Um, and I really struggled with that. And for the first time in my life, I couldn't work. I started having panic attacks and anxiety attacks and had to take a serious look at what I was doing with my career. And that's when I found all the mindset stuff. Interesting. So does, is that where sort of the neuro linguistics plays into that? Was that a part of that journey for you? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2016, I started looking for anything that was out of the ordinary for me. And I found a ton of physical fitness opportunities. I got invited to an outdoor boot camp by a friend of mine. And I remember like crying through the entire thing. Through that experience, though, I met the person who eventually became my obstacle course racer, race trainer. And I started training obstacle course races, and I ran a 24-hour race in 2017. It was through that experience that I got the confidence to open my own business. Once I opened my business, I realized I had no idea how to run it. Like, none. Um, somebody invited me to something called a success boot camp. And I was like, finally, it's here. Like, this is all I've ever wanted to do is be successful. So I'm going to go sit down. The attorney brain in me thought... All right, bullet points, one, two, three, four, five. Here's success. We're going to be good to go. And instead, I listened for three hours while somebody told me that the reason I don't have everything I want is because I'm in my own way. And that was my intro to neurolinguistics programming, and I was fascinated by it. And it's been a life changer. Wow. Okay. Okay. So the um, I, all I could think of when you were talking about the success was I recently started this book, and 
I'm not, I'm, I guarantee I'm not unique, but I don't know a lot of other people that do. I literally will read like five or six books at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes me a really long time to get through any book because I'm like reading a whole bunch of them at once. And I am, um, most people know I'm a book whore. I love books. If you mention a book, I'm going to go buy it, right? We pull up my phone. We could be dangerous together. (laughs) So um, I'm embarrassed over the number of books that I own. But um, I I started reading this book um, recently called, I think it's called The Sexy Millionaire. I want to say that's the name of it i will double check on it we'll put it in the show notes but the um he talks about um success and like that so many people think success means you know a certain income or a certain title or something like that but success is really just about fulfillment right and being able to do the things that you want to do and that it's it's a it's a mindset more than it is anything else, right? So it would be really easy to look at SB Pace or Biz Quick Podcast and be like, you know, to make a quick either we're we're successful or we're not successful judgment call. And I think the truth is it's both of those things. I think in some ways we're really really successful. I mean, we're number thirty four in the Philippines on Biz Quick Podcast, so. I mean, probably higher now, probably, probably higher yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what's happening since, since last we checked the data, <laughs> but you know, we're the fact that we keep pushing forward, that we get obstacle, we encounter obstacles and we move past them. That makes us successful. Do we, are we hitting our revenue targets the way we would like to No. but is that, does that make us unsuccessful? I, I, maybe in someone's book, maybe in Corey's book. <laughs> well, no, I mean, like, like in, in my mind, I mean, we, we set our own schedule. We can go to Vegas and record podcasts for yeah. fun. Yeah, like that's I'd, successful. I'd say we're pretty successful in that regard. Yeah, we're not hitting the, you know, the financial numbers that we would want to be hitting, but. You know. I mean, I feel like exactly. you do, and then it grows, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm going to push back on something that you said because I I think that this is one of the biggest problems with this success oh, mindset. You're, you're not allowed to push back on this podcast. I'm oh, so sorry. Well, I got to go. <laughs> this is the wrong room for me. No, um, I think that's one of the problems is that people think that overcoming obstacles equals success, and it does, but only if it's the right obstacles. And yeah. I realized um, that like accomplishments like overcoming those obstacles whatever they are comes with this dopamine high and you just want to do it more and more and more Mm -hmm. like you get super excited um and this is where that whole definition of like what does success mean to you that i push so hard with people because you can get addicted to overcoming obstacles and then just do it and feel successful and then you wake up and you're living a life that you don't recognize and then you got to break yourself down and start all over which is what happens to so many excuse me so many um highly educated professionals they they are constantly focused on that next scheduled stop i gotta graduate from um undergrad i gotta graduate from grad school i gotta pass the bar exam or the you know med school exam or whatever it is and then um i gotta start my career and do my residency and do my internships and then at some point in time you wake up and there's no other obstacles to overcome and you're just stuck with this life that you never wanted. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking, when we, like, we talk about goal setting and, you know, you want to set these goals and you set the milestones to reach those goals. But when you reach the goals, you have to create more goal, more goals. Like, otherwise yeah. you're just, you're stagnant. And constantly asking whether that's what you really want. So talking about books, um, one of my absolutely favorite books is Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by oh, I love that Mark book. Manson. Yeah, great and book. And one of my favorite parts of that book is where he talks about wanting to be a musician and then realizing that he doesn't want to work hard enough to be a musician, and so he changes his mind. And everybody thought, you know, that's failure. It's not failure to decide you don't want something as bad as you thought you did and adjust and change your goals. But so many times people think, well, I wanted to be a successful musician. I didn't get to be a success a successful musician. That must mean I failed at that. So, or they, they commit so much time and energy into finishing something. And how many times do we see this in business where people build businesses that they don't even want to build because they're thinking, well, I started it. I got to finish it. When you could cut ties, save five years of your life and go do something that you actually want to do. And uh, I mean, failure is one of those things that like it, you just have to be comfortable with. Like you're gonna fail at a lot time. of things. Yeah. Like every and, day. And that's like and one thing. Like you don't want to beat yourself up over it because like that's just a part of life. Like you're gonna try something, you suck at it, try harder, or you know quit. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he talks in that book so much about um, not asking yourself what you want, but asking yourself what problems you're willing to go through to get 
a, a, a certain outcome. And I think that's the conversation that's missed. Like we're in the middle of the Olympics right now, right? I remember wanting to be a gymnast. My mom trying to get me to stretch. I was like, get the hell away from me, devil woman. <laughs> <laughs> So you don't want to be a gymnast? No, I mean, no. I think we all want, like, every little girl wants that at some point, right? And then you realize, like, God, that's a lot of work. And they don't have lives. And look at everything they sacrifice. It, it's really interesting because I find myself saying that word and then immediately pulling back on it. Um, when I got my trainer certification in NLP, I realized I no longer resonate with the word sacrifice. And I think we talked about this in a clubhouse room once. Um, I no longer resonate with the word sacrifice because – they're just choices, right? You're making the choices that you want in your life. It's a, if it's a sacrifice, it's the wrong choice. You know, there, there are things that you don't get to do every single day because we have to make choices. But if it's the choice for you, then it's not a sacrifice. It's just a decision. Yeah. I, I love that mindset. Yeah. Mark, thoughts? <laughs> well, Mark, He's I, like, no, I have no thoughts. Mark, None. I don't, you might have thoughts on this. Corey, told me something this morning that I thought finally an opportunity presents itself where we could be Olympic gold medalists. Uh-oh. They might be bringing cornhole in as an Olympic oh. sport. Yeah. Mark. All right, This guys. is our time to shine. Man. I didn't know cornhole was a thing until I went to school in Michigan. I had never seen the game before. I, I feel like, like you, you intentionally say in that. Michigan so you don't have to admit that you're a Spartan and not a Wolverine. Well, I'm actually not a Spartan. I went to a private law school in Michigan. So oh, okay. I didn't go to Michigan State. Okay, okay. I, but it was in Lansing. Okay, well, listen, then you're good. We're good. That's, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, cornhole is uh, – it's it's fun. That's a – yeah. I, I don't really enjoy it personally. Of course you don't. No. How but, are you guys friends? I don't know. I prefer French darts. It's a much better game. I don't even know what French darts are. Me neither. So I'm going to go on record. My friends and I made up this game. Oh, God. And <laughs> Is this like your golf game where you can only have one golf club the whole time? Yeah, no, that's... Oh, you, that sounds amazing. Yard, I mean, that's the way I play golf anyways. Yard I can golf. only hit one. But. Yeah, yard golf. is That's the, the best drinking game on the planet. But French darts is a great game that we invented, and somebody stole the idea and actually made money off of it, which I'm fine with because I just want people to drink more. But... <laughs> This, ladies and gentlemen, is my business partner. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. Let's let's talk a little bit more about the. She's like so. so change the subject from yes. this. Let's 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 go back to the. I feel like that's your whole like job in this business partnership is changing the subject, like oh, and no. keeping him on track. Oh no, no, no! no. It's absolutely, it's absolutely obvious. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the opposite. <laughs> no. Oh, is it really? Oh yes, yes, yes. There's nobody who gets more uncomfortable with with certain topics than this guy. Ooh. So. This could be fun. Yeah, so he'll just like I was thinking earlier. We you know, we usually use cue cards for each other, like when we're recording podcasts, and we've gotten so good at it that we don't really need them very often. But there's one our card, our set of cards match almost identically, except for he's got the timer one, so we know how much time we have left. And the only card I have that he doesn't have is a card that says it's written in red marker and it says emotional moment <laughs> and it's because you could tell a really sad story about you know your dad passing away and then your dog got in an accident and you know you had a cousin who was paralyzed so let's get back and he'd to be business. like so french darts <laughs> yeah and he would just and so i literally would have to hold up because we had we recorded a podcast once oh God, where somebody amazing somebody was telling a story we've of had him. we've had two people cry on our podcast. Both of them men, right? I know. And I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, but the terrible things, like he gets visibly uncomfortable and he starts looking down when men start crying. Don't cry, Mark, because it'll be really awkward <laughs> in here. But we had someone who was like a business owner who was telling a story of, you know, how she suffers depression and she thought she was suicidal. And he literally went straight to the next question. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me just pause here for a second. I was like, we just need to acknowledge what you just said. And then I have to address it. And he's like, okay. He can't even hear it. You know, he it's, it. He's just like. I feel you. Like, I worked for a really big criminal defense firm here for a little bit. And I was one of the only female attorneys for a long time. And there would be a girl come in that had um, an emotional situation going on, whatever it was. And they'd be like, Amber, I think you need to go talk to her. She needs like a gentle touch. I'm like, and you're picking me? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, like this is, this is not where my strength is. Like my coaching clients don't need a gentle touch. They need to push off of a cliff and then, you know, build the par parachute on the way down. Right. Yeah. And that yeah, it's one of those things, like, it, I see somebody crying at work or whatever, and I'm like, are you hurt? Did somebody hurt you? <laughs> did, did something broken? Yeah. <laughs> did, 
I are feel you, you. Are you hurt? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Corey. Oh, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. All right. Let's talk more about neuro linguistic programming. Yeah, neuro linguistics programming. So, how much do you know about it? Well, I know. So, I read, it's been a while, but I read a book on it um, a few years back. And I, what I can remember is that you can use it. And I was curious how much you use it for your you know, law practice because it's like you can learn where people's memories are and when they're lying by how they look, right? So, I know my memories are this way. Right. I know that about myself. So when I am um, like telling a story or trying to remember facts or something, I'm going this way. But I also know that when I lie, I go this way. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have to be really aware of it because now you know, and you're going to know how to know when I'm lying. But I don't lie to you. So we're all good there. So you're talking about um, in particular an eye patterns chart. And this is used a ton by law enforcement organizations. It's used a ton by interrogators Um, for the most part. Um, everybody has the same eye pattern chart where they access information in Mm -hmm. certain parts of the brain by the way their eyes move, um, where they're either remembering or constructing information. And then if um, it's up here, like if you see somebody's eyes roll up, they're thinking, they're remembering a memory and they're thinking about it. If you see it go to the side, they're hearing a memory. And if you see it go down, depending on which side it's on, they're either um, seeing a memory or feeling a memory. And so you can tell What's their primary emotion? Like, how are you going to relate to this person? If I started talking to Corey, Corey and I were talking about something and I said, hey, like, can can you feel what's going on right now? He'd be like, no, I really can't. I really can't. But if I said, hey, um, can can you think of a time where this was important to you? He'd be like, yeah, let's talk. Let's do that. You know, or or how does that sound to you? How does that sound to you might be better. So car salesmen are trained in this all the time. And it, what's really interesting, so this is, Neuro Linguistics Programming has a ton of different parts to it, um, which is what's given it kind of its bad name among people who don't understand the whole process. Mm-hmm. Um, because you do understand how people think and you understand how they make decisions. There are strategies that we all go through every single time we make a decision. And when you know what you're looking for, you can elicit that strategy and then feed it back to somebody. So you can increase your sales numbers because you know what's important to somebody and you know how to phrase information to them that bypasses their thinking part of their brain, goes to their emotional part of their brain and causes them to make a decision. With that being said, you can also understand where people store their memories. You can understand that when you line 10 people up and you show them the same incident and you get 10 different answers, those people aren't necessarily lying. They all think they're right because their brain filtered information differently based upon their experiences in life and they remembered things differently and what's important to them is different. So when you understand that, communication becomes a different game because now you're not saying, you know, blue means blue. It's like, what does blue mean to you and what does it mean to you? And let's have a conversation about how that's different. Um, So to break it down just a little bit, this idea of neurolinguistics programming, I got into it for the attorney part that you were talking about. I wanted to be a better attorney. I wanted to be a better business person. The emotional side of it was something I never expected. Years of therapy got me to the point where I was able to dig into the things that I dug into in neurolinguistics programming, but I never expected it to have the dramatic impact it did on my life. If we're breaking down the word, neuro is the way your brain works, your um, conscious mind, your unconscious mind, how they work together, where your memories are stored, how you access them, all of that. Linguistic is the words, the words people say. How can you tell what's important to them? Do they like to touch things? Do they see the world visually? Do they like to hear things? Do they think about things? What's important to them? And then programming. How do we reprogram that so that all the bullshit that we've believed our entire life about what we're capable of and who we are and what we can accomplish, how do we reprogram those memories? Because every single limiting belief we have in our life was created in an instant. And you can go back and understand when that instant was and re, um, recreate that or redefine um, the meaning that that moment has in somebody's life. It's crazy. I recently read um, or heard, I can't remember which, probably heard, um, that um, the bulk of our like limiting beliefs, the bulk of like the emotional scars and baggage that we carry with us, the way that we view relationships... Like all of those things, almost it, 
formed entirely from the ages of four to seven. Yep, zero to seven. It's crazy. Yeah, zero to seven is your modeling stage. You're looking at all the people that are around you um, and you're taking in everything that they're doing and you take it all as fact. Seven to 13 is where you start asking questions. You start trying to, or I'm sorry, zero to seven is your imprint. You're taking in everything around you. And then like seven to 13 is your modeling. So you're taking all of that information and now you're trying it on. Mm -hmm. You're trying it out. You're starting to ask questions. When do kids start asking why? When do they start asking, you know, if anybody's ever been in a car with a kid like I used to be, you know, what's over that mountain? What does that mean? What, they, they've got questions, questions all day. Um, and then 14, they turn into assholes. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Um, they no longer need you. The average yeah. four-year-old asks 500 questions a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. So you're right. It is. And you, and you think about all of that. So. Yeah, and I'm just getting into my modeling stage now. So. <laughs> yeah, we all Which have means that. he's basically four. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> tell me about it. Don't I know yeah. it? All right. Well, we've got to wrap up, but thank you so much. Um, it was so nice to meet you in person, and I'm yeah. so glad that we're in Vegas. Um, can you tell our listeners how they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. My podcast is called More Than Corporate. If you're looking for information on how to define success, more information on neurolinguistics programming, or just want to connect about um, – you know, finding that path for yourself, um, you can go to morethancorporate.com and all my contact information is there. Great. And thank you for coming out here and joining us for this podcast. And thank you to our listeners. Thank you to Hot 702.5 FM. Thanks to Mark. You're, You're welcome. <laughs> you were really vocal. Can yes. you like tone it down next time? <laughs> and everything that, you, everything that you need to learn about Amber or us will be in our show notes. Yes, and if you want to work with us, you can um, connect with us on our website, sbpace.com, or find us on social media. We're everywhere, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We have a YouTube channel, and we're finally on TikTok, so I feel like we have hit, we've hit the big time now. Yes, we have. Uh, don't forget to download, subscribe like us give us a review rate us do all that fun do stuff do all the things uh, all everything. the things yeah and if you have any topics or you want to be a guest you can find out how to do that on our website yeah also we wrote a book it's called seriously now what a small business guide to disaster preparedness it is a number one amazon bestseller which means we are really good with the writing and it has a digital download workbook which may or may not have word search puzzles included in it it does not also, if you already have the book, please go back to Amazon, rate and review it, and tell everyone how amazing the book is. And that is it for today's podcast. I'm Corey. I'm Julie. I'm Mark. <laughs> this was Bisquick, <laughs> helping small businesses across America.